Hello, Australia. Welcome to My Millennial Money. And today, on the bonus episode, we're doing a My Millennial Story, and you might see that as MMS. And today, I'm joined by Amy Lewis, and she's got a publication called The Green Millennial. So, welcome to My Millennial Money, Amy. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, I want to tell everyone how you got to be sitting here today. And (laughs) it's a good lesson about putting the hustle in, even if you think it's too late. So, many of you know, I recently hired a graphic designer in the business because, you know, we've always got crap that we need to get out and design and all that stuff. And I I put the ad up and, you know, found the right person, Jess, and she's wonderful and she's such a valuable person to the team already. But like a week after or even a few days after I'd hired Jess, I get an email from an Amy Lewis and she said, hey, Glenn, I know you probably feel the position, but can I still send my resume or my (laughs) thing? And I was like, you know what? I like that bit of hustle. (laughs) So, sure, send it through. Anyway, she sends it through and it was probably the best resume that I have seen, particularly as a graphic designer. So, there was some amazing resumes and... There was people that applied for the role and they were very much overqualified uh, and probably Amy as well, very overqualified <laughs> for, sweet the, of you to say. for the role. However, it stood out to me that for a designer, very clear resume, it was a non-traditional, it was more of a portfolio. You were talking as if you were having a conversation with me. In fact, I would love to even share it if you can do a version up just to show everyone like this is how if you want to get attention, send something like this in, particularly if you're a designer. So, we might put that in the Facebook group where you sent me and you can change it if you need to just with some referee details or whatever. No worries. And But I said send it through anyway because I know a couple of people looking for a designer. Mm. And so, you send it through and I sent it to two people that I know. And they've already engaged you to do some work for them. Yeah. So, it's just funny. And then you were telling me part of your um, resume was the work you've done with The Green Millennial, which is a publication that we'll talk about in a moment. But I thought, I want to talk about Amy's story and find out what she's doing because you really impressed me with just with the hustle of, you know, because realistically, if you didn't get, if you didn't, put that resume to me after the deadline, you would not- We wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't have sourdough starter in my fridge (laughs) that you brought down because I saw a photo or something about sourdough. I'm like, what? Give me- And you wouldn't have got the other two jobs. Mm. So, there's such a lesson there. Yeah. And you can now promote the Green Millennial to thousands and thousands of people that you might not have had that chance to. So- yeah. You've earned this fun in the sun for whatever <laughs> it's worth. So, before we talk to you about your story, how can people find The Green Millennial or your Instagram page for The Green Millennial? Mm-hmm. So, The Green Millennial has a website, which is simply www.thegreenmillennial.net. And you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook with the same handle. Perfect. So, let's talk about you, then we'll talk about the Green Millennial, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then we're going to talk about, because you basically got a little small business Mm. with the publication, so you're going to ask some questions and we're going to workshop it. So, hopefully this episode, you will be encouraged, you'll learn stuff, and you know, if you don't have a small business, awesome, you'll get to hear Amy's story at the start of this episode. If you do have a small business, you'll be able to learn. If you're here for the ride, strap in, we're going to have a (laughs) banger, so let's go. (laughs) So, Amy, I want to talk to you about growing up, your experiences with money and how it may have, I don't know, influenced you to get to where you are today. So, what was it like growing up? Growing up, um, mum and dad always taught me to be very cautious with my money. They were definitely um, savers. 
They didn't spend willy-nilly on anything they didn't need. So that really, that philosophy was passed down to my sister and I. We, um, I'd say we're pretty good savers for young people. <laughs> we're not um, going out shopping every weekend and buying unnecessary clothes and whatnot. I tend to, if anything, I'm a hoarder. Yeah, I wow. hoard my money and I will not spend it if I don't have to. It's a, it's a strength and a weakness. Mm. But so is being a spender is a strength <laughs> and a weakness. Yeah. And I mean, there's like everything in life, we've got to find middle ground. But tell us about the unique family situation that you had growing up. Yeah, for sure. So growing up, my dad was in the Defence Force and that meant we moved around quite a bit. So I think we were talking about it earlier and I've moved about seven, six times in my life, you know, which was quite tricky as you grow up and, you know, throughout primary school and high school, you're meant to be making those deep connections with everyone. But it's a bit tricky when, you know, you just settle down and then dad's like, oh, we're going somewhere else now. That's so but, um, wild, isn't it? It also gives you a lot of resilience. And I guess you get really used to change, which is probably good. Um, and you make a lot of friends along the way. So who can say they've got a friend overseas and like a friend in every state? Yeah. So. It's funny the resilience thing because I think you will use that when we talk about like the business stuff. Mm. Um, it's a it's such a good strength because I probably don't have that because I've only lived in three places my whole life. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so it's it's wild. So you've graduated from university. Mm -hmm. What was your degree? A Bachelor of Visual Communication Design. Perfect. It's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. And when did you work out or find out that you wanted to do, as I coin it, designy stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, all my life growing up, I, I guess you could say I've been arty and creative. Um, I was always doing art at school, always drawing, painting, whatnot. It probably wasn't until I was in my gap year that I really considered it as a career. Um, I had a lot of false starts at university. <laughs> I yeah, think tell us I, about that. Yeah. So I think because I got a good HSC mark, I was like, you know, I've got to put it to use. So I think I tried an occupational therapy degree. I tried, I did it for a week and then quit because I hated it. Mm. Um, and then I think I enrolled in development studies and social science and there were about three or four that I tried um, and it just wasn't clicking for me. Mm. And if I'm not passionate about something, I don't. I don't really do it. So, yeah, that's such a good lesson. Like, there'd be so many people listening stuck in a situation that they're actually not passionate about. Mm. And they might look back with regret. It's like, I knew I shouldn't have started this or I knew I shouldn't have done that. Mm. And I think, again, that resilience in your life to be able to just move and unplug without <laughs> any issues. Because if you don't have that type of thing, like you've moved around homes growing up. Mm. You're like, all right, we'll try that degree. Nah, that sucks. I'll move. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Again, uh, if you are stuck in a situation that you don't love, it doesn't have to be there forever and it's not permanent. Absolutely. Unless you choose it to be permanent. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I guess after those false starts, um, eventually I just found, I think, a local graphic design course, which was six months and... You know, my mom sort of encouraged me and she was like, you've always been arty. Like, why not just give it a go? Mm. And doing that really made me realize that this is what I want to do yeah. as a career. Wow. So amazing. <laughs> Tell us about the Green Millennial. So, you've got this publication. Mm -hmm. How did it come about and what's the story to right now? Yeah, for sure. So, in 2018, I was in one of my final years um, at university and essentially in your last year, you get a whole semester to create whatever you want. And so, I had always loved print design, you know, having something tactile and physical um, and obviously my design style is quite minimal and I like beautiful photography. So, I knew I wanted to do a magazine but um, it wasn't until I was really thinking about it that I was like, why don't I try and make this meaningful, not just pretty? Mm. So, yeah, it just, I don't know how I came up with the name. It was like an epiphany. <laughs> um, 
And so I created the magazine the whole semester. And at the end, I had a copy printed. It was um, displayed at our exhibition. And my tutor kind of said to all of us, really, not just myself, she was like, you know, you've made this entire thing from scratch. Why don't you, you know, launch a Kickstarter or try and sell it? Mm. Um, And yeah, that's exactly what I did. A few months later, I started a Kickstarter for it. And, um, you know, when you put something out there, you don't really know how it's going to be received. But um, so many of my friends and family jumped on board. And, you know, I think the Kickstarter was funded in like a week out of 30 days. Wow. So, yeah, that really gave me the confidence to pursue it and keep going with it, really. Mm. So, um, yeah, the first issue was printed and sold um, online and to a few local Newcastle stores. And, um, yeah, over the past year or so, I've just been working on the second issue, which is out now. Awesome. Now, what does – well, firstly, like the green millennial, Mm. I can only assume um, (laughs) good social impact stuff. Mm. Uh, I've probably butchered saying it that way, but, (laughs) like, just tell us a little bit about the substance of the magazine. Yeah, for sure. And your views of that. Mm Mm-hmm. So The Green Millennial is an eco-friendly publication that celebrates eco-friendly living and beautiful design. So it's meant to inspire and empower the next generation to, yeah, live a a more meaningful life. With purpose. Yeah. The decisions they make, I guess. Yep. Try and live a more eco-conscious lifestyle. Yeah. Wow. And what type of, um, like it's a, it's a beautiful magazine. If I can just lean over. (laughs) I always drop my laptop. <laughs> um, I'm just having a quick look. I mean, it's just such a beautiful. Uh, wow. <laughs> so, okay. So, for example, uh, there's a, a piece here written by Emily Fuller. Mm-hmm. So, do you get content like other people to submit content for you? It's a bit of both. The magazine is probably half interviews where I've reached out to um, inspiring businesses and individuals and the other half is, um, yeah, I guess passionate people who write great content. Yeah. And if you are watching on YouTube, that's the uh, cover and this is the second issue? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, there's a – see, I think it's just fun. Like you've got an article here. Uh, I don't know who wrote it. You'll probably tell me in a second. But – Growing from seeds and seedlings. So, basically, what should I buy? Raising seeds Mm -hmm. and just how to go about that. Yeah, that's urban growers. Wow. Um, So, there's there's a bit of everything in the magazine. It's inspiring individuals. It's got articles about sustainable eating, um, ethical clothing, book reviews, recipes, how to grow your own Seeds and seedlings, yeah. A month without plastic? Yes. Jeez, that would be tough. I'm going to try that this July. Plastic-free July. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. So, this is cool. And it's just a beautiful um, just a beautiful publication. Thank you. <laughs> and so, so, on that, and I mm. guess it might lead to some of the business questions. Yeah. Obviously, you can't go, all right um, – cheap printing from china.com no. and print these. So <laughs> it's obviously it comes at a premium cost yes. because it's not cheap crap. It's eco-friendly paper. It is. Whatever that. Yes. Is that recycled paper. Recycled Perfect. paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, recycled paper. So Yeah. I um how much is an article or an issue? $25. Yeah, $25. Okay, so that's cool. Um and I mean, you you really get what you pay for. I mean, the, it's just so thought out, and I just think so many of um, our listeners here would, I think, get a lot of value out of this. Hopefully, like I, there's a magazine that I contribute to called Wild by Wellbeing. I think I've heard of that one. Yeah, yeah and it's again the same type of vibe. It's this beautiful. It feels good. The article, it's yeah. just not tabloid trash. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's good just as a, a talking point. You know, if you're waiting five minutes before you have to leave, you can just pick up and read an article. <laughs> um, so, there you go. So, how did you, I guess if we move on to like the businessy side of it, mm-hmm. it would be awesome that you make the Green Millennial a national publication <laughs> and 
whatever. Like, mm. just make this a thing. Yeah. So, obviously, you have to sell copies mm-hmm. to make money. Yes. And then do the venture into the commercial space. Mm. So, whether it's paid ad spots or yeah. whatever that might look like. Mm-hmm. With the first couple of issues, obviously, it was bootstrapped as in, you know, people were contributing, uh, obviously, at no cost to yes. them. Mm-hmm. It, I guess it just means, have you started to put a plan in place for subsequent issues? Not really. Right. Please help me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess you say, yes, help me. What, like, I think it's important for you to work out what your definition of success is for the magazine. Mm-hmm. And the reason I say that is because you might have done this project and you're like, I'm going to do two issues. It was cool. I got the <laughs> Kickstarter. I had so much fun. All right, now I'm going to go and make a design agency and get away in my life. <laughs> but then you'll get someone else going, oh, look, it's such a good magazine. Let's commercialize it. And let's take it. And and you're getting dragged along for this ride. It's like, oh, hang on. I don't even want this. Like, <laughs> I was, my definition of success was just to do two publications. Mm. So, I think you need to be clear on your definition of success and what are your goals for the okay. magazine. Yeah. And do you think you know that yet? I think I have a rough idea, but I definitely need to think about it more. Yeah. So, I guess what I would say is what do I want it to be? And if is that four publications a year? So, we mm-hmm. do quarterly or we do two a year? Yeah. So... I think it's then working out, okay, it's almost like this funnel. Um, We want to do three a year, two a year, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. And then I would like it to be ongoing. And then I think for your own sanity, (laughs) you need to say, well, I'm going to commit to two years or four issues or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So, commit to giving a good shake. Yeah. Whatever that looks like. Even... If it's I'm working part-time and I'm funding it myself Mm. to at least get out there and give it a good shake. And then if by the fourth article or I say article, the fourth publication, Mm. if there are no signs of life or if there's no way I need to resolve, hey, this could be another waste of my time if I keep going another three years because of the opportunity cost with other areas in your life. Yes. And in fact, I'm going to actually send you a book that's one of my favorites. I'll get you a, a um, I'll get your postal address and I'll just drop ship it to you. Uh, cool. It's called The Dip by Seth Godin. Mm-hmm. And it is the absolute best read for small business owners. Perfect. Uh, because he talks about basically a dip, when to stop, when to quit, when to, when you're at a cliff, whether you're at a U turn whether you're in a cul-de-sac, Perfect. all that stuff. So That was one of my questions. So. Yeah. so, I think, yeah, just be very clear. And the reason I say that, when we started this podcast, John and I, well, me, and I told John this is what we're doing, he <laughs> agreed to it. I said, we've got to give this 12 months and we've got to commit to it every single week. Yeah. And what success looked like to us was after committing to it for a year, and we really didn't have any sponsors or anything for the first year. Mm-hmm. didn't make a cent. We have to look for a couple of things. Did the market like it? So, did the listeners like it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Sweet. <laughs> I mean, you look back at season one and it was trash. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. No. Well, oh, it depends who you ask. But <laughs> compared to today's episodes, like it's tightened up and it's a lot better. So, mm-hmm. one, um, do people like it? And two... What are the signs of life? Yeah. Now, I think for you, you'd have to just work out your own signs of life. For us, it was looking at the chart of downloads over the year and see that we were actually growing. Okay. So, yeah. we were growing and people were liking it. Yeah. So, we just... And we said, like, we are doing this for 12 months. Whether we get one listener a day or a week in month nine, we are still doing it for 12 months because you've got to get out there for long enough mm. just to give it a shot. Exactly. Yeah. Because the premise of the book, The Dip by Seth Godin is people quit six months in, but the others who keep going for the 12 months make it 
Ah. And there's less competition at the top because more people quit. Makes sense. Totally. So Perseverance. Exactly. Yeah. And my three Ps for business, patience, persistence, perseverance. Yeah. So it's, but within the goal framework that you set for your own business. So what are my goals and what, how long am I going to keep going before I can make a judgment call? Because if for me personally, when we started the podcast, after the first 12 months, if there was no signs of life, so mm. if the listeners were decreasing, so if we started strong and then the listeners went off and there was less people listening each month or if people were hating it, yeah, we could still be going today and not make anything. It was actually just a waste of our time. For sure. And that's yeah. cost me opportunity to go and do something else. Mm-hmm. So I think once you nail that, that gives you the good foundation to start. Perfect. So, And you don't have to even know the answer today. Oh, just, oh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, but it's just something to work to. Yeah. And even within that, you could give yourself a timeline. Okay, I've got three months, two months, 10 weeks or whatever. Mm. Um, even what I do sometimes is um, I don't mind driving. So, I might – like we did a live podcast event in Melbourne. I'm like, okay, I need cool. some um, space. So, I'm going to drive to Melbourne. At least I'll have 10 hours each way. I can listen to an audio book. I can get encouraged mm-hmm. and just get unplugged just to really think. So, whatever that unplugging is for you – with a pen and paper, mm. I drive on you know, long trips and I've got a notepad and a pencil so I can just, if I get an idea, I can scribble it down. As you're driving? Maybe. <laughs> well, it's on the steering wheel. <laughs> Look, let's get, let's not get into details. This is about you, this one. It's not about me. <laughs> or whatever that looks like to you, okay? So, do you have any questions about the small business? Absolutely. All right. Um, let's go from the top. Something very basic. What is an easy or how is an easy way to easily track income and expenses? Because right now, like, you've got to pull the data from, like, your website, like, your socials. And right now it's in, like, a very dodgy spreadsheet personally. Mm. So, what's an easy way, I guess, to... So, you're in startup mode. We Mm. know that. We know it is going to be sloppy to a point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like it's that dance between, well, we don't want to spend $300 a month on a bookkeeper mm, because for sure. we're only generating X amount a month. So, yes. I think number one, the way I would probably do it is make sure for the business, mm-hmm. you've got a separate bank account. Okay. Do you have a separate bank account? No. Okay. So, what you're going to do this week or mm-hmm. whatever, the next couple of days, go to your bank, get a separate bank account. Mm hmm. Just for the magazine. Okay. So, you physically quarantine your money. Yeah. So, any income that comes in goes through that bank account. And even you could say, okay, I earn $500 because someone wanted to put a small ad in there. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep $500 in that bank account. Yes. And then I can invest that $500 back into printing. Yeah. That would be great. Once you get to a level like, so the podcasting business, I've got a separate bank account. And then I've also got a savings account in that company. Oh, okay. And I transfer X amount of week automatically from the main business account into that savings account Mm. just for GST and any other type of investment that I need in the business. Okay. So, the number one thing is just to quarantine and separate the magazine from Amy. Yes. Because it's its own thing. Yeah. I don't mind the spreadsheet to a point Mm -hmm. because it's cheap, it's free. You're not going to be doing hundreds of things a month. No. You might have one tab income, one tab expenses, third tab a summary tab, whatever Mm -hmm. works. As you grow your business, you will form a relationship with an accountant that will need to help you. Yes. As and when you grow, you can say to the accountant, okay, Wendy thinks time to um, turn this up a notch. Yeah. And I think usually with business, it happens organically. It's kind of like you grow into it. Okay. Because the worst thing that people do is, okay, I want to start a business. I'll go and get a 50 grand loan and then <laughs> I will, out of that loan money, I'll pay a bookkeeper from day one and do this. But they're not making any money and the business fails. They've just amplified the losses because yes. they haven't done things slowly and considered and organically. Mm-hmm. So, I think what you're doing is fine, but just get a separate bank account. Okay. Because if all else fails, you can go to the bank account print a statement, income, outgoing, and you'll just know. 
Oh, yeah. It would be... Easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you need to pay for fuel, not a business thing. Mm. You might claim some at the end of the year uh, if you need to buy a new laptop, business thing. So, yeah. it gets very clear that way. Yes. I guess, would you have any advice on pricing? Yes. And talking to, um, I guess, retailers because at the moment, you know, I can't really afford to give a retailer a magazine for $10 because that's how much it costs to print it. So I would be getting nothing back type thing. Yeah. So for example, and again, I know nothing about the print industry. I know nothing about life, but (laughs) (laughs) I just, I think this is good just for us to workshop. And if you've got any ideas when you're listening to this, throw it up in the Facebook group. Say, I just listened to the episode with Amy. Consider this or consider that. So, we'll do try and do a bit of a yeah. community effort. Yes. So, whether you're selling soft drink, whether you're making music, whether you're a podcaster, whatever you're doing, it's about getting eyes in front of your stuff, mm. which is basically another word for distribution. Yes. So, for me... And my podcast, I've chosen to self-distribute, which means I've got to do it myself, Mm -hmm. which is a longer play. It's an expensive play. But if it takes off, I get all the profit. Yes. Because I'm distributing my content. I get approached all the time. Hey, can we sign you up to our distribution thing? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, radio stations have contacted me, all that stuff. I'm like, well, if you want it, it must be half decent. I'll play the long game and keep it myself. So, yes. I've chosen to self-distribute. Okay. Now, if I wanted to join a podcasting network and they help distribute, Mm -hmm. it means any money made, they get a cut. Okay. But it it can be a win-win because without them distributing, would you be making money anyway? Exactly. So, do you want a small part of something big or a big part of something small? Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I've chosen, I want a big part of something big but it's a risk (laughs) because I might not be able to distribute my product and content and it might flop. Okay. So, I'm in a different situation, which means I can afford to take that risk. Mm -hmm. If I, another life or another thing, it might be, well, yeah, sure. I, I need distribution and I'd rather a small part of something big. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so that's a dramatic thing there. Mm. So, so, I've got to ask myself the question. Yeah. Do I want... Do we want to self-distribute? Mm. Um, friends of mine around the corner, Tim, he, he's he got a publication and I think they're making some changes with it. Um, it's up the east coast of Australia called The North Journal. Um, it's a big print thing and they put it in surf <laughs> shops and they put it all that stuff and they self-distribute. Mm. Wow. So, they'll drive their truck up the coast and drop off stuff. Wow. Now, self-distribute in the fact that they're self-publishing. I mean, you can self-distribute and pay a courier. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? But mm. it's um, in my mind, the profit to you, and I don't know if you've thought about this, I don't think the magazine profit comes in the actual sale cost. It's going to be from advertising. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, for example... If you printed it for ten dollars, something like that, it yeah. had an RRP of twenty five, mm. but you sold it to um, uh, distributors at wholesale, or you sold it to the surf shop, and they could, you know, sell it to them for fifteen dollars. They can get a you know spread on the difference or whatever. They can get a ten dollars mm. spread, so they've got incentive yeah. to sell it. Yeah, if that breaks even. Like, for example, even if you did cost you $10 to print and deliver, you sell it to them for $10, mm-hmm. they sell it for $25 and make $15 a copy, it gives them incentive to want to sell it. Yeah. So, you're kind of outsourcing that. Mm. But you've got advertisers, so you're still profitable anyway. So, your meat in the sandwich comes from the advertisers, not in the sale of it. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Advertising's um 
it's a tricky territory that I'm navigating at the moment. It is. Mm. It is. And I'm personally um, trying to navigate it as well with the podcast mm. because I've got a product yep. that we provide content. Yes. And yes, it is free for people to download, mm. which would also mean that the magazine, if you sold it for $10 and it cost you $10 to print, it would mean your product is free for people to listen or read mm -hmm. in terms of business things. Mm -hmm. So you got to make your money from ads. Yeah, it's tricky. It is. Because from an ethical standpoint, exactly. I don't want to put anything in the magazine which doesn't align with my values and its values. Oh, and totally. And I mean, that's that's easy to navigate. Like there was a company who wanted to advertise on my podcast, but they'd been fined by ASIC Ooh. and I didn't want their money <laughs> because it just didn't sit right with me. Mm. So again, I in terms of money, having this podcast – there has been a lot of opportunity costs go out the door because people have wanted to advertise and come on the show, mm. but I think their product's rubbish and they're fraudulent or dodgy or whatever that is. Mm. I mean, they might not be. It was just my view and perception. Yes. And we all know in this world, perception is everything. And we can't control the world. Like, there's risks in everything. Yeah. But it just means if you want more of a say, you have less choice. mm See, I could probably make triple the money I'm making from the podcast at the moment. Yeah. But there's that thing called principles and they're a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> they get in the way of money and it's, it's annoying. Uh, and for me personally, that's why it has been more of a slow burn mm. because I don't want everyone's money. You're trying to keep your integrity. Yeah. And yeah. trying. I mean, whatever's left. <laughs> so, I think if we go with the magazine – if it costs $10 to print, you need to get to the point where you get other people doing the legwork for you. Mm. So, can you even like if we say – I'll use another example. And again, this is just, you know, it's worth what you paid for this. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you get nothing out of this. But if we go the example, uh, Woolworths and Coles mm -hmm. and Aldi and you were making um, – a new version of baked beans or something. Yes. And it's a bit organic and bespoke baked beans. It's probably easier for you to get a meeting with the head of branding or marketing or supplying at IGA mm. who still have a decent network of supermarkets mm -hmm. as opposed to Woolworths and Coles. Yeah. So, all that to say – in terms of distribution, is there a brand, business, whatever, network supplier mm. that is semi-national, that is a bit bespoke, that you can talk to them to help distribute your stuff? Oh, there would be someone out there. I just need to do the research. Totally, totally. Yeah, find and, out the best way to approach them, I guess. Yeah, and give them some meat on the bone. Mm. Yeah whether that be an ad space or... Totally. Or even like, hey, the RRP on these magazines. And again, I know nothing about publishing world. I might be... <laughs> I'm still know. learning myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which is good because it means the way you operate, if it works, you'd be seen as a disruptor because you're not doing things the traditional way. And that's what I mean. I could be saying heresy right now to traditional <laughs> trade press and pr like publication people mm. uh, because I know nothing about it. So... How can we get your magazine in as many people's hands as possible? Now, there is a way to go direct to market through Instagram. Mm. And I think that's probably your first and attack plan because yes. it's visually appealing. Mm. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And then do you – okay, let's – and again, I – you're probably not going to get an, an answer, but I think it's just more just to get the brain yeah. flowing, the juices going. Good brainstorm. Can you get a panel of contributors? So, talk to somebody and say, hey, I want to do four magazines. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to help on the four. Like, we're going to do a, a thing on beekeeping at home, every magazine for the next four sessions. Mm. But for example, if you were to get a regular contributor and say to them, hey... I would like you to be a regular contributor to mm -hmm. this magazine for the next four 
issues about beekeeping at home, different topics. Yep. So, you get your kind of pool of regular contributors. And then how do we engage the regular contributors to say, I will give you the content. So, your regular contributor, even if there was 10 of them, mm-hmm. I will give you the assets to post on social media uh-huh. okay. and I'll give you a link. And if people click and buy it through your account... I'll be able to track it and it'll be like an affiliate link. Oh, okay. So, you give yep. them a cut. Okay. Yep. So, like the scenario of, you know, we might put it in a homeware store or something like that in Byron Bay mm-hmm. and we sell it to them for $10 and they sell it for 25 They get a cut basically. Yeah. If we do it online or your contributors sell it, you give them a cut as well. So, mm. it's almost like, yeah, it's a net net, but at least we're getting the magazines out there in- In front of more people's yeah. eyes. Yeah. So, I'd look at maybe an online affiliate link model. Okay. Or if you can approach some other influencers, mm-hmm. send copies and, you know, maybe just, you've just got to get out and try as much as possible mm. to get people, give them skin in the game. Yeah. So, it's like, hey, the RRP, it's $25. Um, and it's that dance with you don't want to cheapen the brand too much and sell it for cheaper, mm. but it might be like um, tell your followers they can get 20% off, use this code, yep. um, and you can have anything above the $10 or something. Okay, yep. So, if they sell a 1,000 copies, mm. they get a 1,000 times X. Yeah. So, th- it's incentive for them. Yeah, for, to want to sell it. And- yeah, because when I started my business, when I was doing financial planning, my whole goal was how do I get people to send me clients oh. so I didn't have to go and get clients. Yeah. So, how do we get people to sell your magazine for you so you don't have to sell the magazine? And you have to be <laughs> creative and give people a bit of a cut somehow, mm. whether it is a traditional, hey, IGA, my baked beans, they're $10 a tin. You sell them in your stores, sell them for $20 a tin, take $10 on it, yep. like traditional model. Mm. But in the background, if the distribution is a net net, like it's not, it's, it's just a net net, doesn't cost you anything because you sell it for what it costs, mm. then we start to engage advertisers yes. and that's where you make your money. Yeah, okay. And yeah. that's the strategy piece and it's like, hey, we need to do this for 12, 12 months, two years or whatever that is. Mm. We need to move as many copies as possible. I'll take a bath on the distribution. So, it's a net net. So, I'll go and work three days a week mm. doing my job. Yeah. And like this whole podcast thing, I really haven't earned any money from it myself. Mm-hmm. All the money I've earned, I've put back into it. So, I employ okay. Nath full-time as the editor. Yeah. Jess, my producer. Jess, the designer. Yes. I've got all this stuff happening. You know, we've got to buy all this crap. Like, <laughs> everything in the first three to five years of a business, it is reinvesting, getting this thing off the ground. Well, that's good to know as well because when you're starting out, yeah, you don't know, am I pouring too much of my savings into this? How long should I be doing it for? So, it's good to know that. It takes a while to totally. get off the ground. Rule of thumb, and I don't know if it really applies, but it kind of did for me with my other business. The first year, and it probably did with the podcast, to be honest. The first year, you won't make any money. You'll run at a loss. Mm. So, you'll have to put more money in just to get it off the ground. Yeah. The second year, break even. Mm-hmm. The third year, you start to make money. Okay. And as well, the more you double down and get articles moving, Mm. uh, issues moving, the more power you've got to go back to the printer and say, hey, instead of a 1,000 copies at $10, I want 3,000 and I only want to pay $8 a copy. (laughs) And then you're still selling it for $10 to the people that you sold it for $10. Mm. So, now you're making the spread as the, the volume gets bigger because everything online, everything in print, it's a numbers game. Mm. That's all it is. It's definitely cheaper when you do a longer run. Totally. But it's, um, yeah, again, that in itself is hard because starting out, you don't want to have a thousand copies sitting in, at your house. So exactly. I've been doing smaller runs yep. just to, you know, avoid wastage. Yeah, and that's the dance as well. Yeah, yeah. The other thing we can do is issue two. This is in market at the moment. Mm. So, I can still buy it. Yes. What about if for issue three, we did a pre-launch sale 
and get people to buy it up front. Oh, I did do that with this, the pre-sale. Yeah, Yeah, sweet. Yeah, so so I could gauge the numbers. Yeah, so you could Mm. do that in a more hardcore way. Yeah. Just really ramp that up. It is a good method, I guess, especially for small business. Totally. And it builds a bit of hype. Mm. You might do pre-sale at $5 cheaper, $2 cheaper, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Just so people have incentive. For sure. Yep. Depends how much you want to dance with it, but you could go, um, you know, it's $25 an issue or pay 45 and get two issues. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Something like, like that. It's just, there. you've just got to go, any traditional rules I know, you've got to throw them out the window <laughs> and experiment. Mm, yeah. But I just want to say, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I applaud you. I think you're a hustler and <laughs> I'm... Like, if I can do anything to help you, I will. Oh, thank you. And I just, if we can all get behind Amy, jump on the website, order a copy. I'm going to order one myself. (laughs) And let's champion people doing cool stuff. So, there it is, everyone. The Green Millennial. (laughs) And I want you to let us know when you've resolved what you're going to do mm-hmm. and I'll put it up in the Facebook group. Yeah, that's So, I was good. like, I'm going to go for four issues and when you do that, it can be like, I have no intention of making any money. Mm. I'm just smashing out the next four issues. <laughs> yeah. and Because that's when I started the podcast. There's no intention of making money. Yeah. And realistically, for podcasters... Uh, if you're a budding podcaster out there, don't even worry about the money because realistically, no one cares unless you've got 5,000 listeners an episode <laughs> at least. Yeah. Because it's just commercially not worth it. Okay. Um, so, your goal is to absolutely just, I'm going to go for four issues, 12 months, two years, eight months, whatever that is. Mm. My definition of success is this. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to give it a good shake. Yeah. And you know what? If it doesn't work, awesome. I'm going to do something else. Mm. My first kind of creative venture was in 2011. Mm-hmm. It cost me a lot of money and it failed. Can I ask what it was? Yeah. So, I it was when apps were first starting to get popular mm. and my niece, she was one year old and I wanted to make her an app Cute. with her in it. Oh, that's adorable. So, we, um, I got a team of people together. And I learned so much about this process, so nothing's ever wasted. Mm. And I would have spent over $20,000 easy on doing this stuff. So, there's a team of us. It was called Friends Down Under. Mm -hmm. So, I wanted to kind of target the US market. And there was – it was the story of Gracie, my niece. So, she was in it. And then there was the different characters. I think it was like Kip, the kangaroo, Walt, the wombat – Lenny or someone, the lizard, and there was Cute. Eva, the emu. So, there was all these characters. Mm. And part of the app was Gracie had to find her friends down under. Cute. And there was different scenes of Australia and it was basically different things. So, you'd go in and there'd be a spot the difference and you had to press it and all that. Mm. And I succeeded in, I made an app and it's still on some of my friends' phones at the moment. I was going to say, can like, I download it? Yeah, I don't think you can. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But I threw a lot of money out, Mm. but I learned so much and it failed. But this kind of creative venture of podcast, if you call it that, it hasn't failed yet. I don't think it will fail. Well, who knows? But thank you. (laughs) With the stuff that I learned in 2011, Mm. when I was throwing all that money down the drain, (laughs) looking back, I learned from it. Awesome. Awesome. I uh, got some good experiences out of it. I think mm-hmm. we actually made two apps at the end of it. Um, wow. But the problem was I was c- then competing against like big money. And it was just like, all right, this is, it was either go, go, go hard or not do it. Mm. But I, I like your stuff because it's like, it's just with so many things going online, it's so nice to be offline mm. with quality and to be able to learn stuff. Yeah. And just to have that tactile experience totally like matte paper like it's not glossy it there's something about it mm. i'm sure a lot of designers will say it they like smell it they touch it mm. it's nice so what's, <laughs> what's the stock of the cover so it's called 
Revive right. laser. So it's, um, yeah, a recycled paper Great. that's made in Australia, I believe. Mm. Yeah, it is beautiful. All right, Amy, thank you so much for coming on. I've had fun just workshopping your <laughs> little business. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, wish you all the success. And you can, um, you can jump online and grab a copy and support Amy. Love it. <laughs> thank all you right. for having me. Anytime. See you later. <laughs>